Hi, my name is Jeff Nepper. I serve as the executive director here at Canary Labs, and I'd like to thank you for joining me on this walkthrough of the Canary system today. Over the next hour, I'm going to take you through a complete introduction of the Canary system, and uh, I look forward to helping you not just understand more about the technology, but most importantly, connect how to use Canary to problem solve uh, and to essentially do more with your data deliver better results, and get more value out of your process data. Let's go ahead and get started. We've collected some helpful resources that we think you'll enjoy. First and foremost, if you go to canarylabs.com and use the Try Canary feature in the top right-hand corner, you'll be able to enter a sandbox environment of Axiom. Axiom is our data visualization trending and dashboarding tool. So if you want to experiment with Axiom before trying to install Canary and run a proof of concept on your own, you can get a really good sense of the features of Axiom using our online environment. We have an entire community. It's our knowledge base, our forums, a place for you to interact with the development team, with the support team, and with the sales team here at Canary. You can also find all of our upcoming events, both in-person and virtual. And finally, we make learning and being certified on Canary as easy as possible through our academy, learn.canarylabs.com, also accessible through our community. A little a bit about us. The why behind Canary is extremely important. And we know that engineers, they crave, you need, in order to do your job as best as you possibly can, you need tools that are easy to use, fast to deploy, that help you make data-driven decisions. So taking data and doing more with it in an easy-to-use format. And that's what Canary is all about. It's what we've been focused on since 1985. It's what we continue to focus on. Uh, and we believe that it is what we, will continue to move us forward and differentiate us inside of our space. From a business strategy standpoint, Canary uh, works through a partner network. We are based 100% uh, privately owned out of Martinsburg, Pennsylvania, in the middle of beautiful central Pennsylvania, about two hours on the east side of Pittsburgh and about an hour and a half uh, to the York Lancaster area of Pennsylvania. Our job is to focus at Corit completely on product development, support, and the um, uh, continued involvement with our partner channel, building that channel up, helping our partners be successful, and in the end, serving the end user uh, through that partner network. We have more than 120 successful partners within the Canary ecosystem. That's over 3,000 men and women that sell, deploy, and assist in supporting Canary systems. Uh, through that network, we've enjoyed more than 19,000 installations uh, and currently are in more than 65 countries around the globe. If we wanna discuss some very large enterprise applications uh, with Canary, we can look to oil and gas for extremely high tag counts. So an example of that is Murphy Oil, um, who are actually getting ready to crest the 2 million tag mark. That's a completely hosted AWS-based system where they're running more than 40 different asset models using their Canary data and using the Canary system for those asset models. Era Energy out of Bakersfield, California, uh, recently did a complete Pi system replacement using Canary. And that's more than 1.5, actually now closer to 1.8 million tags and over 100,000 of those tags being custom calculated tags. Waste management is collecting data across all of North America from more than 200 sites using Canary system. NASA Cape Canaveral uses Canary for all of their critical asset monitoring. Kinder Morgan and Boardwalk Pipeline, as well as Colonial Pipeline, all take advantage of Canary as well. So as you're journey, journeying uh, with us and you're in the decision-making process of what is the right historical solution for our organization, 
I thought it might be helpful to just do a quick exercise around understanding the data historian um, itself. So a couple questions just to walk through with you. And of course, this being a recording, I don't have the, uh, the benefit of having your feedback in this discussion. So I will supply answers for what I've heard um, from asking these questions one-on-one -on -one, uh, previously. I always like to ask what value up front are you hoping to gain by adding a historian to your site or perhaps trying to standardize on a corporate solution, maybe replace historians that you already have? What is the value that you're, you're trying to gain? It could just be giving almost near real time value updates with historic perspective to your control operators. Or maybe you have uh, a pool of engineers that need to have um, historical trends in front of them for diagnostic information. Maybe it's having some KPIs at uh, team meetings or shift exchange meetings. Um, that you want to be able to cover that show what we've done today and where we're projecting to finish tomorrow. Um, or perhaps it's much more than that. Maybe you need a central repository for all of your process data um, to call home at a corporate level so that you can do advanced analytics, that your data scientist can make queries against that central repository um, and begin to load machine learning algorithms with it. So no matter how you want to use your historian, no matter what type of immediate value you look to gain from it, it's important to evaluate, evaluate what actually is it that makes a historian a historian. You probably can't see behind me, but on my shelf, I have a couple um, very old chart recorders. And if you're not familiar with the concept of a chart recorder, it was just a round piece of paper and a pen that had a sensor or had an input. And as that round piece of paper rotated, it represented um, a 24 hour period and the pin would draw a line uh, on that chart. What about just a simple notebook or an Excel worksheet? If we're recording data reliably with timestamps and values and maybe our quality um, readings on that data, couldn't that also be a historian? Or maybe a SQL database that keeps long tables of all of my timestamps, my values, and my quality scores, or perhaps a very specialized custom-built database just for time series data. All of these are historians. Essentially, anything that reliably records and keeps for a long time period, uh, the history of your data and your readings functions as a historian. But what should a historian accomplish? Because when we think about what value we want to gain from it and what we hope to accomplish with the technology that we select, that ultimately becomes our selection criteria. So why would the chart recorder not function uh, for your current use case? Why would something as simple as a clipboard uh, and a piece of paper not work? For some processes, they simply would work. But for more advanced processes, we need to focus on things beyond just having the data in front of us. So if we consider what the actual role of a historian is, we can, we can look at our solution and choosing a solution based on this concept of three pillars. So if data source, if the data sources are our foundation, what we're hoping to build upon that foundation, um, the end result, if you will, is to get information that we can actually act upon. So it's not a, a matter of just recording data. It's having the data so that it's accessible, so that I can access it and gain value from it, ultimately information, and then knowing the right decision to make as a result of that information. And there's three very important pillars that have to be present in order for a solution to really work for most organizations. And that's the concept of openness. Openness means that I don't have to only use this platform to problem solve. It means that I have standardized protocols to ingest or consume information that are universally accepted. And I have open standard protocols to be able to publish or to extract the data out of the system when I need to act upon it. Secure. 
two different aspects of the word security. Of course, we can mean having um, the ability to lock a system down to keep those that don't belong from accessing it. But we can also talk about the data integrity um, of, the, of the actual archive itself. How safe, how secure, what type of security do I have that the information that's in here is truly the information that was gathered originally. And then finally, adaptability. Every organization is different. Your process is different than your competitor's process. You, the way that you go about uh, making your product, the architecture of your systems, it's all different, even though you might be in the exact same vertical. So in order to make sure that you can do what you do to the best of your ability, we believe that the historian solution has to be able to adapt. That means the way it's deployed, uh, that means the way that it's used, has to be able to adapt to fit your model. So if we do these three things well, openness, security, and adaptability, if our solution is built on these three pillars, we know from our experience, and that's now um, a bit over 35 years in this space, we know that that is the winning formula for you to be successful. So you're going to hear throughout uh, me walking through uh, this overview, you're going to hear openness, secure, and adaptable over and over from me. So let's talk about the Canary system now. Let's introduce you to the actual technology that makes up our solution. I think it'd be easiest to think of the Canary system in a series of steps. Step one, step two, and step three. And step one is the concept of collecting and storing your data. Step two is, is the idea of adding context to that data archive. And then step three is pulling information because of context, pulling information out of the archive that I can then act on inside of um, my operation. So taking that operational process data and understanding the problems that lie ahead of me today, tomorrow, next week, this year, maybe even throughout your career. If we look at those three steps, you'll find that there's various canary components that work together. So consider them as like a microservice or applications that Canary has written that integrate and work together to accomplish those three goals. Our data collectors, our store and forward, and our historian. They work together to help collect and store data. The Canary View Service and the Calcs and Events Engine are how we add context. And then we feed that data out through a series of publishing options, as well as our dashboarding and trending tool, Axiom. That's how we get the information to people and systems. If I take those seven components and, and arrange them visually, it would look something like this. This is the map of the Canary system. And essentially it's been designed so that we can make it easy to consume data from the left, from devices and SCADA systems and other databases and servers, collect it, store it, contextualize it, and then publish it out on the right to your people and your systems. So our goal to make this process easy and not cut corners while we're doing it. So we don't want you as a company to struggle with getting valuable information out of our system. And that's why our focus is going to be on openness, on security, and adaptability. So let's talk a little bit about each of these sections. If we start with the data collectors, this is a series of uh, drivers, would be the easiest way to think of them, that help you to connect to all of the standard protocols that you see inside of your industry, as well as to a lot of SCADA systems, even PLCs and other IIoT devices. We're then able to take that data and using our store and forward technology, reliably, even over the most troubled of networks, move that data securely without any chance of loss to a Canary historian. And that could be a historian that's sitting out on the edge or perhaps inside of your facilities. 
It could be a historian that is at a corporate data center, one that's hosted in the cloud, or it could be all of those replicating to one another in a tiered approach. Once data is in the historian, now it becomes the challenge of providing access to that data, um, following best practices, of making sure that only the right people are able to access that and that they're only able to access the data that they should have um, authorization to do so with. And that's where our view system comes into play. The view service is that central hub, that single endpoint where everyone and everything that wants access to a Canary historian must come to. That includes our own internal uh, applications. So Axiom, which is again, that visualization tool. So I can build trends, I can build dashboards, I can do condition-based monitoring, all using my browser-based uh, visualization tool, Axiom. It comes to views. The calcs and events server, where I can build new tags, where I can create um, condition rules that watch and trip a start and an endpoint for an event and then create their own custom event database, it uses views. All of our data feeds, things like APIs and ODBC connectors and MQTT publishers, all of it also uses views. The reason for this is that within views, I can add additional context. I can add metadata, I can create asset models, I can do a lot inside of views and everything that extracts data from the historian has the ability to use that context that's built inside of views. So this is a high overview of the Canary system. And if you understand these seven boxes, these seven pieces, how they integrate together and work together, then you will begin to have a framework to reference as we dive deeper into each of these sections around the Canary system. So I look forward in the next video of walking you through the data collectors, the store and forward, and the historian. Then in a follow-up video, we'll do the calcs and events and the views. Another video for the data feeds and Axiom. And then a final video that will walk through the business model and make sure that you understand exactly how Canary is licensed, what the costing is of the system, um, and some other high-level um, business model kind of Q&A, if you will. I hope this has been helpful for you. If it has, we'd love to have you share this internally um, or provide feedback to us.